humanity, not just solely by Shila Brindiki, but we become the chair of divine grace, Shila Prabhupada Ki. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya 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 Haribol Nanda, can you hear me? Nanda. All right, so uh, we've got a bit of a dilemma here because I didn't know, I just immediately assumed that we were doing text 26 Although it's the appearance day of all these saints like Sri Baladev, Vidyuku Asana, and Ganga Mati, and appearance of Ganga Puja, normally it doesn't sort of constitute that's going to be a whole lecture on these great souls, but maybe we just mention them in passing. And we happening but Shanti's also you've got the next one's text 29 so you've also got text 27 and text 28 there's purports to both of them so maybe we can tell Shanti just to do 27 28 he's got plenty to go on with those ones too is that right okay so that way I can do 26 like what I've prepared I've got a little bit about that okay <sighs> so we're doing text 26. Is that on the board? We're good. Thank you, Yulan. Tadvishva Guru Adikritam Bhuvanaka Vandyam. Divyam Vichitra Vibhudakriya Vimana Sochi. Apu param mudama purvam upetya yoga. Maya balena munaya starato vikunta. Tad vishva guru adikritam bhuvaneka vandyam. Divyam Michitra Vibhudakya Vimana Sochi Apu Param Udam Apurva Mupetya Yoga Maya Balena Munaya Stadato Vaikunda Tad, then, Vishva Guru, by the teacher of the universe, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Adikritam, predominated, 
Bhuvana, all the planets, Eka, alone, Vandyam, worthy to be worshipped, Divyam, spiritual, Vichitra, highly decorated, Vibhuda Agriya, of the devotees, who are the best of the learned, Vimana, of the airplanes, Sochi, illuminated, Apu, attained, Param, the highest, Mudam, happiness, Upurvam, unprecedented, Upetya, having attained, Yoga Maya, by spiritual potency, Balena, by the influence, Munaya, the sages, Tap, by Kunta, Ato, that, by Kuntam, Vishnu. Thus the great sages, Sanak, Sanatan, Sananda, and Sanat Kumara, upon reaching the above mentioned by Kunta in the spiritual world, by dint of their mystic yoga performance, perceived unprecedented happiness. They found that the spiritual sky was illuminated by highly decorated airplanes piloted by the best devotees of Vaikuntha and was predominated by the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Purport. <coughs> Supreme Personality of God is, is one without a second. He is above everyone. No one's equal to him nor anyone greater than him. Therefore, for he is described here as Vishwaguru, is the prime living entity of the entire material and spiritual creation, and is Bhavanaka Vandyam, the only worshipable personality in the three worlds. The airplanes in the spiritual sky are self illuminated and are piloted by great devotees of the Lord. In other words, in the Vaikuntha planets, there is no scarcity of the things which are available in the material world, they are available but they're more valuable because they're spiritual and therefore eternal and blissful. The sages felt an unprecedented happiness because Vaikuntha was not predominated by an ordinary man. The Vaikuntha planets are predominated by expansions of Krishna who are differently named as Madhusudana, Madhava, Narayan, Pradumna, etc. These transcendental planets are worshipful because the personality of Godhead personally rules them. It is said here that the sages reach the transcendental spiritual sky by dint of their mystic power. That is the perfection of the yoga system. The breathing exercises and disciplines to keep health in proper order are not the ultimate goal of yoga perfection. The yoga system is generally understood as a stunga yoga or city, eightfold perfection in yoga. By dint of perfection in um, yoga, one can become lighter than the lightest and heavier than the heaviest. <clears throat> one can go wherever he likes and can achieve opulences as he likes. There are eight such perfections. The Rishis, the four Kamaras, reached Vaikuntha by becoming lighter than the lightest and thus passing over the space of the material world. Modern mechanical space vehicles are unsuccessful because they cannot go to the higher region of this material creation and they certainly cannot enter into the spiritual sky. We learn this fact also from an incident concerning the Vasamuni, Maharaj Ambarish. It is understood that in one year, the Vasamuni travelled everywhere and went into the spiritual sky to meet the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Narayan. But Oh, by present standards, scientists calculate if one could travel at the speed of light, it would take 40,000 years to reach the highest planet in this material world. But the yoga system can carry one without limitation or difficulty. The word yoga maya is used in this verse. Yoga maya balena vaikuntam. The transcendental happiness exhibited in the spiritual world and all other Spiritual manifestations there are made possible by the influence of Yoga Maya, the internal potency of the Supreme Lord, personality of Godhead.
Om Agena Timi Randasya Jananjana Salakya Chaksura Militam Yana Tasme Shri Gurve Namaha Gurgame Patmendasya Skalapati Pati Mahusva Kupayuta and Santa Shantu Lambanam. This is a really beautiful purport. I didn't want to give it up. <coughs> I want to hog it. So, in the beginning, you probably about stalking about <coughs> um, the Supreme Lord. He's the proprietor of everything. So, we have that beautiful sloka in the Brahma Samhita, which is probably one of the easiest ones to learn. So, if you want to learn the sloka and practice the sloka learning, Ishvara Brahma Krishna Satchidananda Vigraha Anadir. Adi Govinda Sarva Karana Karanam. So it's just each word is very significant. Ishvara Lord means Lord's the supreme controller. Parama is the paramount. You know the word paramount? Not none greater than that. Paramount. And that's his name is Krishna. Satchidananda Vigraha, we all know what that is, don't we? Happiness, eternity and bliss. Vigraha, that's Krishna's form, that's emanating all of that Krishna. Anadir, what's Anadir mean? Let's stump the champions. Anyone? Means without a beginning. Anadir, that is without a beginning. Adir is the original Govinda. Sarva Karanam is the cause of all causes and all that there is. So, of course, in Bhagavad Gita, in the chapter 7, it says the same thing here. Uh, that, uh, what's the sloka? That um, Krishna, the Lord, is the creator of both material and spiritual worlds. Forget that sloka there in the seventh chapter. But um, he said all of, everything emanates from him. So, we have this uh, three quarters of the creation of the Lord is spiritual. It's all Vaikuntha planets and then of course there's other planets and the ultimate planet is Goloka Vrindavan. And uh, then we have one quarter of that corner which is a dusty corner. It's just covered by Pradhana. Uh, <coughs> sometimes it's manifest into universes with Lord Vishnu lying on the causal ocean. But the difference between the spiritual planets and the material planets is that the Lord is visible in the spiritual planets, but not as uh, rarely seen in the material world, just in his form. He's never seen as Mahavishnu, the creator of all the universes. And when he appears as Gabadakshai Vishnu in the uh, Gabadak ocean, then the lotus stem comes from him. But the creation cannot see him. He's lying in the cause of low. He's lying in the Gabadak Ocean. He can't be seen. And in Tiradoxa Vishnu, the third expansion of Vishnu within the heart, we can't see him either. He's in our heart. And sometimes it becomes revealed to that pure devotee or yogi who is able to achieve full samadhi. And then he's um, revealed. He reveals himself to him. But sometimes that yogi cannot see him as a supreme personality of Godhead mistakes himself to, to that form to be himself. So also in the material universe, the demigods, they perform the jagyas and Lord Vishnu personally comes to accept the share of offerings. But he is there and he goes back to his planet of Sweta Dweep, but he's not in charge of any particular planet or he, he has given it to Lord Brahma to um, do the secondary creation. So this is the um, this is the viewpoint that is being presented here in this translation that if everybody who's a ruler in this planet is a conditioned soul and we're all subject to birth and death, even Lord Brahma, Abrahma, Bhubana, Loka, Puna, Avatana, Arjuna, that uh, even Lord Brahma suffers birth and death. So the rulers of the planets, even though the demigods and they've got such great positions, these positions change. This is the attitude that the Kamaras, that's why they're so relieved to be in the spiritual world, that it is unchanging, it is everlasting. Whereas in the material world, things change. Even 
In one day of Lord Brahma, there is so many shifts of positions, like there's how many, 14 Manus in one day of Lord Brahma, and 14 King Indras, and 14 moon gods, and sun gods, and wind gods, so many different, all the demigods change. Um, so that's eight times in, or oh, 14 times in one day of Lord Brahma, constantly. And then of course, nobody, lives longer than that day Lord Brahma because there's a complete dissolution within the universe and Lord Brahma once again has to create it all after he sleeps for 12 hours, annihilation, then there's creation again. It's constant change. Whereas here we're discussing that the uh, four Kamaras are so blissful, they've attained the spiritual realm. So in the spiritual world, Lord, he's a, he's a ruler. And um, everything that he rules is spiritual. All the facilities are there. So we're talking about the demigods flying in the beautiful planes. We described a couple of verses ago that their planes are made of lapis lazuli, these amazing shining um, emeralds and precious stones. And it says that they're illuminating the whole vacant planet. And of course, they travel so fast, they're traveling at the speed of mind, the person that is riding in the airplane. And they're eternal, and everything is connected to the Supreme Lord. And Prabhupada describes that the Supreme Lord is present in his various forms. It's said somewhere else, correct me if I'm wrong, but there's 64 different forms in the Vaikuntha planets of the Lord. So we see that on the cover of the Srimad Bhagavatam in the first canto. The Lord's got four arms. One arm, he's got a conch and a uh, club and a um, lotus and a disc. Another arm, uh, another picture, his disc is on his other arm and so on and so forth. There's 64 different forms of the Supreme Lord and Orion expansion of Krishna, but there are trillions of planets in the... Um, in the spiritual sky, just probably should probably talking about Devasamuni, how he went to all the planets trying to shake off the Sudasan chakra, uh, which he inflicted upon himself because he committed great offense to Maharaj Ambarish, who we know was um, completely absorbed in worshipping his deities. So the deity manifested Sudasan chakra to protect him from. Devasa's curse, he's trying to shake it off and go to all the planets. It took one year to go to all these planets here in the material world. I mean, Srila probably explains that, hey, it might take one year here, but there's trillions of planets in the spiritual sky. That's the amazing thing about the, it's like three quarters of Krishna's energy and we're only a small part of it here. So it's explained that, um, where are we up to? Same, yeah, so. In those spiritual, in that spiritual realm, the Supreme Lord is there, and everybody gets to see him. And it's a wonderful situation, but it's in a different sort of category than what we are um, um, cultivating our um, bhakti yoga. And we're doing that love and devotional service. But in the Vaikuntha planet, there are uh, the aspects of you know, neutral, neutrality and servitorship to the Lord. So there's that awe and reverence that the Lord's always the most opulent, the most wonderful. And even though the residents on his planet, they may have the same bodily features or some planets, they have the same opulence, same palace as the Lord. How about that? Or they've got constant vision of the Lord, constant association. Still, the Lord is different. He's far superior above them because he's the Adi Purush. He's the original. He's the most beautiful. So there's that all reverence that the Lord is the supplier and benefactor of everybody. It also said that there's a little bit of friendship there because that's the third rasa. But the friendship is a formal friendship, just like we can understand there's different sort of friends, right? We have our intimate friends that we can sort of confide in and trust and then there are other friends that uh, we just um, associate with um, out of love out of affection right and there's formal formality different types of friendships but that friendship is not there the one like 
where Krishna shares with Arjuna where they have intimate pastimes like that. That's not available in the Vaikuntha planets. So the four come still there's that eternity, there's the bliss, there's the knowledge, it's all there. So the four Kamaras, they felt jubilant when they entered into the spiritual atmosphere and rightly so because if you remember previously, the four Kamaras, they used to be um, impersonalists, right? So they med meditated in impersonal Brahman and then when they smelt the tulsi leaves at the feet of Lord Vishnu, they become great devotees that they actually realise that the Supreme Personality of Godhead is the, um, is the Supreme Person and that they were part and parcels and their servants of the Lord. And in that ecstatic state, it's said that that joy is like thousands of times greater than the Brahman, that the Brahman realisation. So they're totally jubilant and they enter into the spiritual atmosphere there and they're eager to meet they're eager to meet the Lord of creation and then they're going through Vaikuntha they're seeing all this they enter into one of the planets and immediately make their way to the Lord's palace to get an audience with the Supreme Lord how are we going all right I've got this very very nectarian piece it just I feel like reading it because I picked up the um, Bhagavatam reader because I forgot the name of the person in the Bhagavatam reader. My memory's gone. It's Gopa Kumar. And then I just hit the right spot, which just like the sweet spot. And I really want to share it with you. I've sort of great. I've got a great fear that 80% um, of this uh, audience here will fall asleep, but it's still worth it because the other 20% will get the nectar. Okay, so. So stay tuned. So we're going to read this about Bokamar, that he's travelling, he's left the universe and he's attained by Kunta and he's looking around and here it is. It's just like the, it's in the same, just that same moment that the Kamaras are coming into that planet of Lord Vishnu. This is parallel and I hit that page. So I feel like Krishna wants me to read it <coughs> for the benefit of Lord, for the Lords. So... As I watched those persons come and go, I thought, this is Gopa Kumar speaking, what kind of Lord must it be who has such servants? Thus I thrilled with delight as I waited in the gateway to Vaikuntha. I excitedly stood up and sat down, stood up and sat down till the associates of the Lord returned, rushing back and escorted me inside. The amazing things I then saw, more wonderful than wonderful, even the thousand-headed Anantashesh would be unable to describe, even in the lifetime of Lord Brahma. I arrived at several more gates, uh, one after another, and at each I was met by similar doorkeepers, which allowed me to enter only after announcing my arrival to the immediate superiors. As I entered each gate, I saw the guards offer obeisances to the local superintendent. So I assumed that he was the Lord of the universe, overwhelmed with reverence, just as before I repeatedly bowed down and recited prayers. Finally, the Supreme Lord's compassionate men who were guiding me told me the special signs by which to recognise the Lord. They also taught me what prayers to recite and what etiquette to observe. I passed rapidly through many districts, wonderfully splendid with all kinds of houses and gates, and then I entered the most excellent transcendental neighbourhood. There I came to one place at whose feet many others stood in attendance, a palace distinct, overflowing in greatness, where excellence seemed to reach its highest limit. Radiant like millions of suns and moons, it captured my mind and eyes. Within that palace I saw before me at a distance the personality of Godhead, Lord of Aikunta. He sat at leisure on the best of royal thrones, a golden throne shimmering with the glow of many jewels. The cushion on which he sat 
was of one white cotton, fine, attractive, spotlessly clean, and the soft, handsome bolster on which he leaned his left elbow and upper arm appeared like a full moon cleansed of its spots. He was the presiding lord of blossoming youth. The brilliant effulgence of his sweet, attractive limbs defeated the splendour of new rain clouds. That effulgence lent further to grace his garlands, cosmetics and garments already graced by jewellery made of gold bedecked with gems. His four shining arms, long and well built, enhanced the beauty of his bangles and anklets. Two silk garments dressed his body in charming earrings set off his round cheeks. On his broad chest was the Kastuba jewel, on his conch shell neck a string of pearls, on his moonlike face a nectarian smile. His lotus eyes were live with playful glances. His, the great compassion he felt made his beautiful eyebrows dance. Rama, goddess of fortune, his ideally matching consort, standing by his left side, reverently offering him Excellent panda chew, which he accepted. So I'll keep going with it. Servants stood all around him, worshipping him with great respect. Their appearance like his, their hands beautified by the transcendental items they held for his service like slippers and yucktail fans. Three Narads dancing and his experts singing Vena playing created such a clever entertainment that the Lord, his two consorts, Rama and Dharani, sometimes laughed out aloud. To add to the special ecstasy of his devotees whose hearts were fixed on him from time to time, the Lord extended both his lotus feet as a way of offering himself. In this way, he exhibited his splendour. <coughs> Some, um, all right, okay. So the fullness of the ecstasy of this sight brought on me made me forget what the attendants of the Lord had instructed me. I cried out again and again, O Gopal, my life and soul, and I ran forward to embrace the Lord. Some discerning attendants who were standing at the Lord's aid side held me back, and I was heartbroken. I cried out in helpless distress again and again, overcome by my own excessive love, and fell unconscious in the front of the Lord. With some effort, those attendants lift me up and after some time I regain consciousness or wipe away my hands with flood of tears that block my eyesight with difficulty I finally open my eyes then I heard the Lord the best of merciful persons tell me in a deep gentle voice please come back to your senses dear boy come here quickly so that was a little bit of a um, chapter there from the Brihad Bhagavatam Rita where Lord um, Gopakama meets Lord Vishnu and then Lord Vishnu tells him that he was always a part and parcel of him and it, that he's welcome back and hope he just stays in Vaikuntha forever. But Gopakama was destined in his um, coward boy clothes and everybody had the opulence of Vaikuntha. So everybody was spotless, dressed in beautiful jewels and garments and everything. And they look at him rather sort of queerly and he's explaining, well, Krishna is the Lord of my heart, he's a cowherd boy. You know, again, yes, yes, that is just an as another aspect of the Lord of Vaikuntha, of Narayan. As we know, um, in the material world here, the Vedas, they described as the ten avatars, the ten incarnations of Lord Vishnu, and of course Krishna is one of them. So they had that attitude, yes, that actually Krishna is one of the incarnations of Narayan. Yes, he manifests himself like that. But that's not here, that's not happening here. Why you just roll on that one? Because Gopama, Gopakama was a little bit upset at this because even though Lord Vishnu was so beautiful, we had just heard about his radiance and his glories and everything, still there were a few features missing that Gopakama worshipped in his own Sri Krishna. And as we know that even this aspect, this beautiful aspect of Narayan, still has not got all the full qualities of the Supreme Personality of Godhead that even Krishna is more beautiful than Narayan. His pastimes are more um, outstanding, famous, gorgeous, and he has heaps of loving devotees always reciprocating with him. And I can't remember the fourth one, I'm sorry. So anyway, 
So uh, Gopakumar is dwelling on that aspect of Krishna. So um, I just wanted to sort of uh, give that explanation. It's so beautiful. So what, one thing that we can see is that there's a bit of a contradiction here that uh, we know we worship Krishna in his high bo highest abode of Goloka Vrindavan and we know that Krishna is happy to dwell in the forest all day. So he's in the forest uh, engaging loving pastimes with his devotee friends, the coward boys and the gopas. And we just read that there's no dust in Vaikuntha. We heard about that, how the queens are cleaning the palace, but there's no dust. They're just doing it out of their expression of love for Krishna. But in Vrindavan, there's lots of dust. There's dust everywhere. It just when Gopa Kumar leaves Vaikuntha to find Krishna and he eventually ends up in Goloka Vrindavan, he's standing there looking for Krishna and everybody's staring in the distance and all of a sudden there's this heap of dust that comes up from one direction there and here's the conch shells blowing and here's Krishna and the hooves of the cows are just bringing up so much dust that actually you can imagine Krishna's also rolling in the dust and he gets cleaned by Mother's soda. But that dust, um, the devotees are desiring to roll in that dust because it's all touched Krishna. So when Gopa Kumar, he waited for Krishna to come back and then he saw the dust and then he saw Krishna's form and Krishna come running to him and they hugged in such beautiful fashion, loving loving exchange that Krishna just got his friend back. So that is the higher rasa. That begins with friendship. Then there's the feeling of um, Vatsalya rasa, parent, and, and then the feeling of a uh, intimate, a loving union with Krishna, the Madhura ras. So these are the higher rasas. So that is uh, the wonderful aspect that we're learning in our process of Krishna consciousness. I have to shortcut it a bit here, unfortunately. So uh, this can be compared to um, us. Um, what we're learning here, we can make a comparison about in the material world, you want to learn something. I know one of my sons, he went to a diving school. I don't know, has anybody learned diving? So first you have to go to a school and they teach you all about how to control your breath and then when you immerse yourself in the ocean you come up slowly how to use your apparatus and things like that and then when you know all that then you go to a swimming pool and you jump in the swimming pool so you get to know um, get to practice everything and learn it and then you come up for air and finally you're ready to go into the ocean so this is a bit like what we do in our spiritual life here, that we are um, trying to assimilate what is going on um, in the spiritual world. So we have that um, liberate, all the liberated souls are acting in a particular way and we've been given that process in the disciplic succession whereby where we obtain that um, lifestyle and through that process, we can achieve our ultimate destination. So the process is hearing, chanting, remembering, offering prayers, deity worship, and ultimately surrendering our mind, body, and words in loving service of Krishna. So this is our diving school. This is what we are learning. So when we get to that platform, transfer the spiritual world is instantaneous. Prabhupada just mentions that how in the material world we're looking up in our mortal bodies and we're seeing the stars. Yes, they're over there. And how, how incredible is it that we know that the speed of light is going like, oh, I'm, a, I'm a miles person, don't know how many kilometres, 186,000 miles a second. I will never forget that. I learnt that at school, right? 186,000 miles a second. And then you do your, do your math, 60 seconds in a minute, 60 minutes in an hour, 24 hours in a day, seven days in a week, 365 days in a year, and 40,000 light years later, we come to the topmost planet. Just scratching our heads at that one, aren't we? 
you know, and, and the scientists are talking about going to the moon, going to the Mars, but it's actually a really fruitless endeavour because this is compared to a prison. Like if you go to a prison, you ever been in a prison, Kelki? No, no, oh, well, we can stay away from the prison. <laughs> I have. <laughs> Well, I've been in jail. I haven't been in a prison. But if you go to a... <laughs> well, it's not quite the same. But if you go to a prison, usually they let you in through three gates. I think I went to Pentridge once with Duster Mohan. We were doing some preaching. So you wait at one, <coughs> one uh, waiting room, then they let you in through one gate, and then another gate. Because you've usually got all these big walls, right, that you, you know, and the prisoners are in there. And they're often contemplating what it's like, life is like on the outside because they're just contained in, the, in these walls and <clears throat> that's, they can't get out like that unless uh, they get good behaviour and, and then the authorities let them out. So in one sense we're like this, we're looking at the prison. And even those yogis who have got that city, mystic cities, there's a planet called Siddhaloka where all the... Um, yogis have perfected their cities and they've got all these uh, qualities like Prabhupada says, lighter than the lightest, <coughs> heavier than the heaviest and so on and so forth. They've got that there. But with those cities, they can't get out of the universe. They may be able to go from one planet to another. And that sort of makes sense now why you've got all the different coverings in the universe. You know, you've got the earth and then ti ten times that. You've got water, then ten times that thicker than that, you've got air and so forth. You've got all the material layers around the universe. So that's to keep everybody in, even the cities, they can't get out. So by special mercy, the four Kamaras, as Sri Prabhupada was saying, they got the mercy that they become lighter than the lightest and the lightest, and then they were able to escape this material universe. But it's only for a period of time, and then they still have to come back. We know that they're great saints and they're preaching glories of Krishna, and they're one of the 12 Mahajans. So the yogis, they can travel at the speed of the mind, but ultimately they have to come back here when all their pious activities have run out, back here again, start all over again, perform the same austerities to get back over there. So it's just a constant revolving door. So for the devotees, <coughs> ultimately by forming bhakti, we can um, focus our mind on the Lord and not only at the speed of mind, but it's instantaneous that at the time of death, if we're thinking of the Lord, we are escorted out of this universe just like that. There's like a secret passageway, whatever, <laughs> the, the, the other dimension, the porthole, right? That we're just taken back into the spiritual realm like that. So there's a way out. And the only way out is through the performance of bhakti yoga and loving devotional service to the Lord. So that... <laughs> We've been plugged into the system there by the mercy of uh, the Guru Parampara, which gives us this knowledge, which comes right back to um, Lord Brahma there. And I just want to say that in our prayers that we chant, Dayam Stuvam Stasyaya Sastri Sandyam Avandi Guroshi Charnaravinda, the three times a day. We offer our obeisances to the spiritual master because he's shown us the right path back to Godhead. Jai. I finished. Any questions or comments? Yes. Um, maybe, I don't know if it's for peace of mind or humility, but a devotee doesn't necessarily meditate on trying to escape the material world, but to ensure their perpetual service. So it wouldn't matter where they were. Yeah, that, that, that is correct. But <clears throat> at the same time, it's a, um, there is that aspect that we take repeated birth and death and that is a painful situation. So, you know, we know that four Kamaras, they're great devotees also. and the bliss they felt of sort of getting out of the material world. It's, it's, so right, to, it's right to feel place. that happiness just to get out of this material world because it doesn't always go our way. I know we're all supposed to be chanting and be blissful in whatever situation, was it say in happiness or distress, but still it is a very distressful situation and Prabhupada always says 
What's he say about this material universe? Mm. No fit place for a gentleman. <coughs> Just while I know what came here. All good? Go. Thank you very much. I totally appreciate it. Hurry, ball, Hugh.